When Mark Andressen wrote his um, Wall Street Journal article in August 2011, in, in which this famous, quote, software is eating the world appears, he was really addressing the question of software disrupting every single vertical, whether through digital transformation of incumbents or through new startups built um, on software um, that would show up in the markets and, and, and create new opportunities there. What Mark Andressen wasn't expecting, though, was how ubiquitous open source would be in the course of a decade. If we look at the numbers in 2018, uh, those numbers come from um, Black Duck, a, a company that does merge and acquisitions audit about 1,000 to 1,200 each year. In 2018, 96% of the applications that they surveyed um, contained open source components. And in those, open source was actually accounted for over half of the code base. So with that, with that in mind, uh, I, I think it, it's time that we revisit Mark Andressen's um, uh, decade-old uh, statement and transform it to say that, in short, open source is eating the world. So although pretty much everyone that is building software now is using and relying on open source, um, for a substantial amount of the software that they're building, it turns out that still very few companies actually contribute back to open source. And, you know, this begs the question, well, why should companies contribute to open source in the first place? Why would they do that? What's in it for them to some degree? And the answers we have to this question usually are... Um, very much kumbaya uh, answers, for lack of a better word. Essentially, we're talking about, well, you should contribute back because it's for the common good, or it's paying it forward, or it's the right thing to do, et cetera, et cetera, right? So none of these reasons are really addressing genuine business-driven reasons for a company to contribute to open source. And the problem was addressing open source, um, contributing to open source that way, is that when you put these um, lightweight, feel-good reasons on the scale and you start comparing them with counter-arguments that will arise from other parts of your organization, such as losing IP or losing a competitive advantage, or increasing uh, your risk surface, or wasting resources on open source that can ultimately just help other companies, um, or just the fact that as, an, as, as a company, you don't really have the know-how of how to contribute or how to release open source, then this makes it really difficult to concretely, solidly make the business case for open source inside of your company. And so the purpose of this presentation today is essentially to move a place where, as an industry, we understand the return on investment, the ROI, of using open source really well. Uh, the, you know, the, the proof of that is that everyone is actually using open source. Um, and doing, well, realizing, first of all, that we don't really understand the value of contributing to open source that well. Um, and, and giving us a, a number of tools, a toolbox, essentially, to be able to assess the actual benefits contributing to open source would have for our organization and be able to argument it and present uh, a strong business case for doing so. Um, the other aspect, um, obviously, is that the risk of contributing to open source are not really well understood. Uh, like the, the shark here, we are concerned, uh, we're scared of sharks when, in fact, they're essentially not really dangerous animals and they, they don't kill 
they, they kill way less people than, than bees or, uh, or even dogs do on a yearly basis. And so uh, our fear of um, contributing to open source is based on un, not well understood risk and exaggerated risk. So let's start with trying to understand the value of contributing to open source. And for this, we'll look at three categories of benefits of open source. Strategic benefits, operational benefits, and what I like to call second order benefits. Let's start with strategic benefits. One of the key strategic benefits of open source that is used by companies is using it to commoditize your complement. Well, what's the complement to, to a business? It's the thing that needs to exist so that you can sell the products that you are building. So let's have a look at some concrete examples and how that translates into open source projects and open source involvement in, in, in contributing to projects. Google, for example, well, their key focus, their, their core focus of their business, obviously, is search. And what's the complement to search? Well, it's a way to bring eyeballs and people to search, right? And well, it turns out that, unsurprisingly, Google is heavily invested in two open source projects that do just that, the Android um, platform and Chromium, which is behind the Chrome browser. Let's look at Intel. What's, what is Intel's core business? Well, Intel builds and sells chips. What's the complement to a chip? Well, an operating system, obviously, and hence, unsurprisingly, it turns out that Intel is the biggest contributor to, to Linux. Talking of Linux, Red Hat, the second biggest contributor to uh, Linux, um, essentially builds services and packaging around Linux and hence contributes to it. Um, Facebook, that's a really interesting uh, example because it, it stretches this um, idea of commoditizing your complement a bit and lets us see how open source can benefit us in very unexpected ways. Um, you can say that Facebook's core business is actually data mining of uh, user um, behaviors and, and, and finding patterns that it can then um, sell to uh, advertisers to do targeted advertisement. And so um, if you think that uh, data mining is their key focus, um, then obviously the complement to data mining is all of the hardware that you need to have to build the data centers that um, Facebook is relying on for, for stocking and processing all of the user information. And so a number of years ago, Facebook started the Open Compute Project, which, which is essentially uh, open sourcing um, um, data, data center plans and uh, server and hardware um, uh, specifications. And as a result of this, um, Facebook uh, mentioned on, on numerous occasions that it, had, it was able to save billions of dollars by creating a level playing field for the hardware manufacturers and being able to really just pick from um, the, the vendors that were the most interesting to them, that were all building to their specs. Another very common strategy um, used um, for open source is to on-ramp developers onto paid offerings. So it's a surprise to no one in 2020 that um, developers are actually critical in the purchasing decisions of organizations because once a developer knows a technology, pr prototypes a new product on that technology, it is fairly common for that technology to end up in production and thus was sort of like enterprise level uh, service agreements after that. And so unsurprisingly, um, cloud providers um, and related sort of infrastructure providers uh, ha are focusing on open source uh, significantly to bring developers 
to their offerings. It explains, uh, for example, why Microsoft bought um, GitHub for seven and a half billions a couple of years ago in order to really drive uh, usage of its Azure platform. Now that we've looked at strategic benefits, let's look at operational benefits. So those are interesting because they are actually useful to companies um, that are not necessarily buying, uh, sorry, selling software directly. A key one, obviously, is paying technical debt. I think we've all been there, used a, an open source project, forked it to fix a um, bunch of things that were specific to our needs, and then um, had to handle sort of patching it, pulling uh, new versions, and ended up with a lot of work in that space. And sometimes, as a result, not patching for security issues fast enough, etc. Well, there's a really easy solution to that problem just upstream your changes, right? Contribute back your changes to the community. And suddenly this kind of like um, technical cost just essentially disappears. Another really interesting um, benefit of contributing to open source is um, to leverage the external contributions. A great example is React. Um, when Facebook released React, they also wrote a bunch of white papers um, for sort of like other pieces of the ecosystem that would be uh, useful to React applications. And lo and behold, uh, the community actually wrote things like React Router and Redux based on those white papers. And really quickly, the teams at Facebook that were relying, that were using React and had built internal equivalents to React Router and Redux, realized how bad are these external tools were and used them instead. And the other interesting benefit here is that um, they were also able to hire from the contributors to these projects. So the last category of benefits of contributing to open source I'd like to look at are second order benefits. And to better understand what those are, Let's start with this diagram. This diagram describes um, the process of engineering, and it shows an engineer that takes as input a problem in coffee, and that spits out as output a solution, and as byproduct, sarcasm. If you change that slightly and consider the same process diagram for software engineer, nothing much changes except the output, instead of being just a random solution, is now expressed in code. Turn the same software engineer into an engineer that is contributing to open source code. And what you will see is that this output, this code output, is now feeding a, the pool of comments. And shortly thereafter, what happens another software engineer comes to contribute to the same pool. And what's really interesting is that this other engineer can come from a completely different background, whether it is cultural or it could be a corporate um, engineer or instead a student uh, or a hobbyist just enjoying this um, particular project. And soon these two software engineers will start interacting. Um, this could be just through random conversations on a mailing list or GitHub issue. It could be in code reviews. It could be through mentoring. It could be um, through networking events in, in, in real life or online, etc. Now, remember the sarcasm as a byproduct that I was uh, mentioning earlier. That's there more as a joke. Turns out that byproducts are really interesting. And obviously, all of this conversation, code reviews, mentoring, etc., going on also creates byproducts. And when you think about those, they are the key to the second order benefits of open source. Let's have a look at a few. Um, as you can see from those, 
Oh, there are a lot of byproducts of having people work together on open source code. It's hard to figure out exactly what the benefits are here, so let's organize them in four categories that um, essentially are benefits to projects, individuals, teams, and organizations. Um, and as you can see, benefits to project will really be focused on how, how the code and its documentation um, is improved as a result and uh, of, of being an open source project. Um, for individuals, it's really about leveling up engineers and having them build uh, the kind of skills that will make them better leaders um, and will also give them more opportunities. As a team, teams that participate in open source um, get to meet other teams that do the same and this obviously feeds um, efficiencies and innovation. And finally, at an organizational level, um, companies that contribute to open source tend to see as a result improved culture and moral, being perceived as leaders, access to a talent pool that they would not have access to otherwise, being remote friendly, which again in 2020 is a really um, nice byproduct, um, and reducing things like churn. All right, so um, by looking at all of these new benefits of open source, we're now sort of tilting the scales uh, back in favor of contributing, but are doing this with solid arguments. So the other thing that we have to do now to really c continue completely tilting the scales and in, 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 in showing the benefits of open source is to actually assess the, um, uh, the, the, the negative aspects um, that people mention when we talk about contributing to open source and um, wonder whether there are actually uh, really that uh, concerning. So one of the key things that shows up all the time is contributing to open source means losing your competitive advantage. So two things here. First of all, obviously, no one is suggesting that you should contribute the code that is absolutely critical to your business and that you see as a huge competitive advantage. Frankly, if you look at all of the software stack in, a, in an organization, that's usually a really small chunk. It's not the whole thing. So start by contributing code that isn't key to running your business and, and go from there. The second aspect, which I find really compelling, and sorry to, to use this overused Wayne, uh, Wayne Gretzky uh, quote, which says, I skate to where the puck is, going to be not to where it has been, um, is that it turns out that if you want to be effective at competing against other companies, just copying them is really a bad strategy. Like it doesn't work. You're always late. You're always um, a couple of years late and that's not how you win. So the, the real concern of like, I'm going to build all of this um, software and other companies are just going to come and steal it and then beat us at our own game is um, widely exaggerated. Another one, uh, another problem that shows up really often is lost IP. If, if we contribute uh, to open source, we're going to lose IP. And here the question is really one of what's the value of IP compared to the value of having uh, great innovative teams that are able to iterate quickly and ship software, which is what you get when you have uh, amazing teams of engineers that are able to contribute to open source and that are happy to do so. So I'd like to quote uh, Jan Lacan here, who was the head of uh, Facebook's uh, machine learning AI division. Um, and he says the following, in today's world of fast paced internet services deployment, owning IP has become considerably less important than turning research results into innovative products as quickly as possible and deploying them at scale. What matters is shipping innovative products. So build the teams that help you do that. And one of the best way to build teams that help you do that is to have a really strong open source culture within your company. All right, so there are a, a bunch of other risks of, of other issues like increased risk, wasted resources, lack of know-how, et cetera. 
that um, uh, are also interesting to tackle. We don't really have the time today, but I just want to mention that most of those are either exaggerated again or can be handled, like lack of know-how. It's easy to educate, hire the right people to help build that internal culture. All right, so having done this, we're really tilting now the scales in favor of contributing to open source. Uh, but of course, uh, what you have to remember is like that's going to be different for every company. And so what I wanted to do here today is give you the tools to be able to do this um, and to be able to do this for your specific context and your specific organization, right? So the key here is this is a framework to think in terms of business trade-offs, right? Um, what's a benefit? What's a risk? Um, and um, understanding that um, in some cases, risks can overweigh benefits, but in general, that is not the case. The second thing is this is actually a toolkit, right? There are benefits and there are mitigation strategies, and you should use those and apply those to your organization. So when you do that, uh, uh, a few suggestions. First of all, be reasonable. If, if your company just invested heavily in a patent portfolio, it's going to be really difficult to make the case for giving all of that away, right? Um, second thing is show empathy to others' needs in the organization. Understand why legal is pushing back. Understand what it is that they need. Listen to them. Um, it's very often the case that there are communication issues um, uh, that prevent uh, different organizations within a company of finding common grounds and being able to move forward. So listen to others. Aim for small wins. Start small. Um, Start with a hackathon or contributing back to a project that is not critical or releasing a small piece of software or organizing an event or um, giving money, sponsoring some of the, the, the dependencies that are critical to your business and that are open collective or something like that, right? Start small. And the key is to remember that this is a mindset shift, right? Move from the notion that open source is good and that you should contribute to it because that's the right thing to do, right? To the notion of seeing how open source contribution is aligned with your business, the business goals of your organization and can help drive them. You will find that conversations, once you adopt this mindset, this mindset conversations with executives and business leaders um, and legal are going to be way more easier because you're suddenly speaking the same language.